Hello and welcome back to another edition of Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle. Thanks for joining us today. And I want to give a, uh, a special acknowledgement to all our listeners overseas in occupied territory. We're sorry that you live in occupied territory, but we are with you in spirit. And for all those folks that are listening to us in English-speaking nations overseas, uh, we're with you, at least in spirit. Uh, in the studio with me today, again, is Jared. Jared's going to do his absolute very best to keep me on track and sounding good today. Uh, my coffee mug of the week. Hey, my coffee mug of the week comes from my friends at Gunsight Academy in, uh, out in Prescott, Arizona. If you've never been to uh, Gunsight, you should go at least once if you're a dedicated gun person. And uh, don't forget the intro music is from our friends Madison Rising. Hey, Jared, or is Madison Rising going to be at NRA this year? Do you know? Uh, I'm not really sure. I'm pretty sure that they are, though. Yeah, last year, uh, Madison Rising was, uh, they did a live appearance actually at the NRA annual meeting, and uh, we're hoping to see them again here in a couple of weeks. Hey, when, before, right before we started recording the show, we got a, uh, a surprise present in the mail. Uh, our good friend Mike at the sign station of Pinellas, Florida. Mike is a student of the gun, he's uh, been a fan of ours for a while. And he does some some really good work. Uh, Mike's actually the one that made up our official uh, I Am a Student of the Gun banner. If you've seen any of our live events or any of the pictures that we have up on Facebook or what have you, uh, you've seen that banner. Uh, but he also uh, he sent us a sample of his new stickers. He has some really uh, good-looking bumper stickers that say Liberty or Death. And uh, the, the words liberty or death is inscribed over the top of what looks to be the uh, Constitution of the United States. So if you're in Pinellas, Florida, and, uh, and you need a sign or a banner or whatever, check out the sign station. Uh, the sign station is run by a student of the gun. And what could be possibly be any better than that, Jared? Absolutely nothing. Exactly, exactly. Now, of course, we could not bring you this show without the assistance of our sponsors, and we always want to take a moment to acknowledge them because uh, not only are they our sponsors, but they make some really cool stuff. Uh, <laughs> Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. Yes, I am always wearing my Crossbreed. If I have my pants on, chances are really good that there's a Crossbreed in my waistband. And also our friends, Keltec Weapons of Cocoa, Florida. No, they don't make parts for NASA. Yes, they make guns for you. So keep that in mind. And, and, of course, our bandwidth sponsor is our friends at the Firearms Radio Network. And, of course, uh, we are appreciative of the guys at Firearms Radio Network for all the support that they give us for giving us the opportunity to record this show and to bring it to you guys out there. So if you're ever uh, on the FRN website, uh, check them out. And for all things student of the gun, you know, in case you guys are – if you're new to the show, hey, great. I'm glad that you found it. Uh, you're one of thousands of, of uh, people that have been following us the last two months since we launched our inaugural episode. But all the Student of the Gun material, whether it's uh, my articles, uh, whether it's the show material, if you don't know, uh, we've been doing Student of the Gun TV for going on. Our, our, we're in our third season right now. And we put the video material up online so you can watch it every week. You can watch a new show. And if you missed one, you can go to the archive section. You can watch the old shows in the archives. If you're a student of the gun, you're a beginner once, but you are a student for life, or at least you should be. And if you want to be a student for life and you want to tell people, you can get yourself an official student of the gun T-shirt. Now, uh, this is the third week we've been doing the student of the week contest. And uh, if you write in and we pick your question, uh, you will be our student of the week, and you will get yourself an official student of the gun T-shirt just for uh, taking the time to write in. Jared, tell us who our student of the week is, and what was their question? Our student of the week is James Andrews from Ohio, and he wants to know what your first handgun was. What was my first handgun? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, my first handgun uh, was an Ivor Johnson 38 special revolver. I, I still remember it today. Uh, we were living out in, in Ohio, as a matter of fact, at the time, and we lived on a small farm, and I convinced my mom we were at a, a flea market or a, a large community garage sale or something, and they had guns. And uh, I convinced my mother at the time that it would be a good idea for her to buy this 38 special revolver. 
and a 20 gauge shotgun. I convinced her that we needed both of those for the farm. So she she acquiesced and she bought it. Now this Iver Johnson, and they've been out of business for a long time, and this pistol has been discontinued for a long time. It was a 38 special five shot revolver, and it had a pinned cylinder. That is, an, it had a removable cylinder pin like your old six guns. Some of you uh, firearms buffs might remember this one, and it actually had a swing out loading gate. Bless this gun's heart, it was worn out. The the uh, the timing was so bad that you really couldn't shoot it double action. You had to actually thumb cock it. Had a two inch barrel. It had little tiny grips like they used to make back in the fifties and sixties. And I could barely hit the side of a barn. Now, I didn't shoot our barn, but I shot out behind the barn. Uh, I could barely hit anything with it. Now the first handgun that I actually did well with, or that I actually was able to shoot well, was a, a Ruger Mark II. A good friend of mine uh, uh, had a Ruger Mark II. He took me out to a, 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 a landfill. <laughs> all right, all you guys out there in the audience, how many of you ever snuck out to the landfill and shot old typewriters or cars or refrigerators or what have you? You, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. So the first uh, first handgun I ever actually owned was an Iver Johnson 38 Special Revolver, and I was actually 17 or 18 when we got it. And of course, uh, I turned 18, and I was too young to buy handgun ammo. They wouldn't sell you 38 Special handgun ammo unless you're 21. But what you could buy was one of those old Lee hand loaders. I mean, the actual hand loaders. And you could buy uh, actual bullets, you know, projectiles, and you could buy powder, and you could buy primers, but you couldn't buy the loaded ammo. So I got a, uh, I got 50, 50 rounds of Federal thirty eight Special, and I commenced uh, reloading those cases way more times than they probably should have been reloaded. But uh, that was my first handgun experience. And uh, then, of course, uh, when I was 19, I was able to go out to uh, – Colorado and take a training course with John Farnham. That's really when I learned how to shoot a handgun. Now, let's. You, if you're listening right now, you're listening on Monday, the 22nd. Uh, we actually recorded this before Monday, but uh, you didn't know that until now, right? <laughs> uh, what is on everybody's minds? What is on everybody's lips? What has everyone been talking about for an entire week? Uh, and, and if you uh, have been paying attention to studentofthegun.com, to our Student of the Gun homeroom episodes, to this, to our special report, we did one the day after the bombing uh, in Boston. We've been talking about what can you do as a citizen, as an American citizen. You know, right now we had another terrorist attack on U.S. soil for 10, 11 12 years, but at least 10 years, we've been been under the oppressive thumb of the Department of Homeland Security and the TSA. How many millions of people, good American citizens, have been molested and abused and embarrassed? You know, how many, uh, you know, Marine Corps veterans or Army veterans with prosthetic limbs have been molested by TSA agents or six-year-old, five-year-old little girls had their you know, TSA agents put their hands down their pants. What? And for what? What have we been told? We've been told it's all in the name of security. It's for your own good, peasants. You need to just shut up and submit to this, to these. I'm sorry, but, you know, if you don't have probable cause to stick your hands down my pants, get your hands out of my pants. All right. But uh, so a, a million American citizens have been molested and abused by the TSA over the last 10 years. And what do we have? We have 18 to 30 year old men, Muslim men ages 18 to 30, committing terrorism on our soil. The same thing that we had on 9-11-2001, Muslim men age 18 to 30, we know who it is. We know who the bad people are, but we've lost the will to address it. We've lost the will. We've allowed the politically correct in our nation to beat us down, to beat us into submission so that we're afraid to speak the truth. We're afraid to say what we know is true. It's like looking up at the sky and afraid to say that it's blue because someone will say you're a color racist 
or I can't say the grass is green because someone might not believe that like I do. It's ridiculous. Oh, we can't say that Muslim men age 18 to 30 commit 99% of all terrorist acts. We're not allowed to say that. Yeah, but it's true. Yeah, but you're not allowed to say it. Why? Well, here we are again, you know, 10 years later, billions of dollars in, you know, homeland security money spent. And how many people have been put on, you know, citizens have been put on terrorist watch lists and refuse to be allowed on flights. Uh, I mean, if you're paying attention, if you know, you know, you watch the news or you know, even if you follow conservative blogs or whatever, what, an eight-year-old little boy was put on a uh, the terrorist watch list and his parents couldn't get him on a plane and they wouldn't take his name off, and they even defended it. They're like, well, you know, our, our policies are good policies, even though sometimes they keep eight-year-old little boys from flying. Really? Come on, people. So what do we know at this point in time? As I sit here behind the uh, uh, black carbon steel student of the gun microphone, uh, we know this. We have jihadist number one dead, room temperature. It will soon become worm food. Yay, team. We have jihadist number two, captured, hospitalized, critical condition, last we heard. Now, here is the trap that we fall into by pre-recording the shows. By the time this reaches your ears, jihadist number two may have expired. We don't know that. But as the show is recorded, these are the facts that we know them. And unlike... <laughs> Unlike CNN and MSNBC, uh, we're going to do our best not to just wildly speculate on things that we have <laughs> that we know nothing about. <laughs> All right, what did we? You know, what, so what happened? We had two deliberate bombs, bombs that were set off deliberately at the finish line of the Boston Marathon, and uh, they were set off at about three hours and thirty minutes into the race when statistically. Most people that run the marathon are finishing it. You know, the, the supermen, they all finish it in two and a half hours or, let, you know, around three. The average guy who just does the marathon because he wants the, you know, the personal fulfillment of having completed it around three and a half to four hours. So they deliberately timed it so it would be a very crowded and busy area. They put their improvised explosive devices down and they went off and they maimed what, what, what do we know now? The, the numbers change every day, and that's the crazy thing. But we know three people died initially. We also know that over 100, 120, 150, depending on which news story you read, could be anywhere from 120 to 170 people were injured, and some of them critically injured, as in they lost limbs. Uh, they're probably, you know, if a you know explosion rips through your kneecaps, you're you're going to be injured and you're going to be suffering for a long, long time from those injuries. And what it, so what did we have? It we had a mass casualty event. We had cat people laying all over the place, bleeding to death, and we had people that wanted to help them. Now the big question that you need to ask yourself. If, especially if you're a student of the gun, if you believe in a citizen's right to protect himself with a firearm and you carry or you have a gun at home, you need to understand this. Good guys bleed too. You can't shoot a wound closed. And, you know, here at Student of the Gun and through our, you know, I've been writing, like I said earlier, uh, for 20 plus years now. You know, I've been doing articles. I've been teaching. Uh, I've been working with the U.S. military, teaching the the TCCC or Tactical Combat Casualty Care. Uh, you know, teaching buddies how to save buddies' lives. We're not talking about EMT or paramedic or prairie rescue. We're talking about you're an 18 year old PFC, and so am I. You get blowed up by an IED. What can I do to stop gap your injuries, keep you alive while we're waiting for the pros to show up? And that's really what it's all about. It's not about, oh, well, I'm going to become an EMT or I'm going to become a paramedic or what have you. It's no, can I do something effective to keep this person right here? And this person could be my spouse. It could be my child. It could be someone that I, that I truly care about. And what can I do 
to stabilize them to stop gap that injury while we're waiting for our turn to get into the ambulance, to get to the hospital. When you've got 170 people that need immediate medical attention, there aren't 170 ambulances there. And even in a big city like Boston, you still, it's going to take time to triage people, to get people to the you know ERs. And even if you're in a big city, if you live in a big city, a big city can't treat 170 casualties all at the same time immediately. It just doesn't work like that. So what can you do? Is there anything that you can, and the big question is, is there anything you as the armed citizen can effectively do to help people? Can you do that? Do you have the capacity? And this is where we as gun people or as the good guys, we fall into two camps. You have the the one camp that has been told or been taught or they feel that the citizen cannot do that. The citizen is incapable of doing that. And when I say doing that, I mean rendering life-saving first aid. And I'm not talking about Heimlich Maneuver. I'm not talking about CPR. I'm talking about dealing with the big three. And you guys, uh, the, you dedicated students, I know that you know what the big three are. But if you're new to it, I'm going to tell you the big three are major bleeding. And I'm not talking about boo-boos and cuts and I scrape my hand on a, a fence. I'm talking about bright red blood is pumping out of your limbs. Okay, that is a life-threatening situation. If we don't address that quick, fast, in a hurry, you're going to die. And you're going to die before you get on the ambulance. That's what's going to happen. Uh, so you've got that. You also have loss of an airway. And yeah, you know, if your you know if your throat is crushed, uh, it, you know if you're if you receive a major airway injury, it's going to be difficult to maintain one. The biggest people that we need to be concerned about are patients who have been rendered unconscious for by their injuries. Unless you're going to sit there right next to them and monitor their airway the entire time, you need to do something to make sure that they have an open airway because it doesn't matter how many bandages you put on them or how much CPR you give them. If their airway is blocked off, they're going to expire. That's all there is to it. And then the third one is is a little more uh, really deep in the in the weeds, but it's called attention pneumothorax, and that's what happens when one of your lungs gets a hole in it. Now, this could happen because you were stabbed or shot. You know, a projectile or some object or instrument, you know, penetrates the the chest wall and the per, the pleural space and puts a hole in your lung. Now, when God made you, He gave you two lungs. Yay, team! And you can live with only one functioning lung. What you cannot live with is a pleural space or chest cavity full of outside air. Because what happens is that air builds up in the chest cavity. It starts pushing on the heart. Guess what? The heart doesn't like it. Your heart does not like that extra pressure from the inside of the body pushing on it. And if it, you don't relieve that tension, if you don't stop that from happening, even though you still have one good lung working, that patient's going to die. Now, the good news is, it takes a while to die from attention pneumothorax. You don't just you don't do it in thirty seconds or sixty seconds. But what if you're waiting? What if it, you know you're waiting for the ambulance or your turn or the you know the life flight? The helicopter's on its way. It'll be here in thirty minutes. I'm not talking about Boston. I'm talking about you're out hunting with your buddies, and you know, something happens, and you're in the middle of BFE nowhere. And you're able to get a cell phone signal or get out to the road or what have you. And, you know, transport's going to be there within 30 minutes. That's a long time to deal with, to have a hole in your lung. Now, you don't have to die from that. And the whole point of this conversation is what I'm telling you guys is right now in, what, in the United States military, whether it's Marine Corps, Navy, Army, Air Force, what have you, before we send our kids, our 18, 19, 20-year-old kids, before we send them overseas into combat zones, we train them to stop gap their own injuries and to stop gap the injuries of their buddies. This is what we teach them today. We teach them self-aid, buddy aid, professional aid. That's how it works. So you don't just lay there on the ground screaming for a medic, waiting for him to run you know, over to, fi to find you. In today's modern warfare, in today's battlefield, before the medic gets there, 
he really expects that you've already taken some steps to stopgap that injury. And we're saving more troops' lives today than we ever have because of this. And when I was teaching the TCCC to the young kids in the military, you know, it, it occurred to me, or like that flash of lightning, I said, if we can teach an 18 or a 19-year-old kid to do this, why can't someone who carries a pistol who got their fingerprints taken, did the CCW course, you know, completed the background check, all that stuff, why can't that person be taught to do the same thing? Certainly, if you're responsible enough and mature enough to defend your life with a handgun, which may de facto include you taking someone's life, how can you not be taught to do stopgap emergency medicine to keep someone from dying? And when people, you know, unfortunately, I've had a lot of uh, civilian medical professionals or civilian medical people, EMTs, paramedics, and, uh, you know, occasionally doctors or nurses will say, oh, you don't understand. You don't understand the liability involved in that. And I look at them and I say, excuse me? Oh, there's, there's, you can't teach citizens you can't just be teaching citizens to do medical care or traumatic medical care and use tourniquets and stuff like that. You can't teach them that because there's too much liability involved. And I say to them, yeah, but they could kill someone in the defense of their own life. They may use a firearm to shoot another human being. There, ladies and gentlemen, there's no greater liability on planet Earth than exercising deadly force against another human. That is the greatest liability you can encounter. Everything else pales in comparison to that, including using pressure dressings and tourniquets and, you know, nasal pharyngeal airways, things that you're supposed to be afraid of. And the reason, uh, thank you for sticking with me up to this point because I do have a point. My point is this. If you are ever involved or you are ever in a situation where either yourself or someone you care about becomes a victim of a traumatic injury, you're going to want to do something. You'll want to do something. Okay, you grabbed your phone, you hit 911, come quickly, send an ambulance. All right, now what do you do? The ambulance will be there in five minutes. So you can either stand there with a phone in your hand and hold the person's hand for five minutes and say, hold on, hold on, hold on, the ambulance is coming. Or you can do something to actually stop gap and do something effective. So the question you have to ask yourself is, if that was me, if I was at a parade and a bomb exploded and I looked down and my spouse is laying on the ground and there's bright red blood pumping out of you know his or her leg, I'm going to want to do something. The big question mark is, will I be able to? to do anything. Will I have the ability and will I have the equipment that I need to do something effective to keep that person alive while we're waiting for the big shiny box with the flashy lights to show up and all the guys with the big backpacks? Uh, will I be able to? And it, it really, uh, I'm going to be honest with you guys, and of course I'm going to be honest with you because that's just what I do. It offends the hell out of me when so, supposed medical professionals tell me that you can't teach citizens to use a tourniquet or pressure dressing because they can't be trusted to do it right. All right, I got I to gotta riddle me this, Batman. So my spouse is laying on the ground and there's bright red blood pumping out of their leg. And I don't do it correctly, but I do something. Well, is that better than me just standing there and watching them bleed to death? They're like, no, just use direct pressure. Use direct pressure. Okay, great. Well, first of all, if you've got a femoral bleed, you know, a bleed in your femoral artery, your, your, uh, your quadriceps are big, thick muscles. It takes a lot of pressure to push down on a quadricep to stop uh, a major bleed. But let's just say you do. Okay, you put all of your muscle all of your on that. You stop it. Now what do you do? Well, what do you mean? I put direct pressure on it. Okay. What, what do you, how do you dial the phone? How, how do you deal with the fa fact that they might have gone unconscious and you need to uh, address their airway? Uh, how do you deal with their bleeding arm? Uh, exactly. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, you don't have an answer, do you? No. So stop telling people that they can't do it. Ladies and gentlemen, it infuriates me when people that are supposed to be good guys, people that are on our side, look at American citizens and tell them, you can't. You're incapable. You're too weak. Bull crap. The United States of America was not founded by weak, helpless people. In the wake of this bombing attack, another unjustified attack on the U.S. of A., okay, you have a choice to make. You can just throw your hands up and say, I'm a victim, and I need someone to come save me. Or you can say, I'm an American, and Americans are strong, and Americans are winners, and Americans don't throw their hands up and say, I'm a helpless victim, come save me. That's not what we're all about. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not about being helpless victims. It's time for American citizens to harden up, to say, I am not going to be a victim. And to say, well, I'm just going to go ahead and throw my security into the hands of a benevolent government agency. Bull crap. As we uh, record this, what do we know about jihadist number two? If you've watched the news, and if you haven't, I'm with you because I... It drives me crazy. Uh, they just say the same thing over and over and over again for hours, and so I just t- tune it out. But how did they find jihadist number two? Well, they sent like hundreds of you know SWAT troopers through the neighborhoods, through the houses, you know. And, and I'm not going to get into that right now about whether or not the Fourth Amendment was violated, or should I, Jared? Okay, do we suspend the Fourth Amendment because there's a suspect on the loose? Oh, there's a suspect suspect on the loose. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights no longer apply. We'll give them back to you when we feel like it. I'm not really sure that's the way it was supposed to work. And uh, But they, the bad guy, jihadist number two, was discovered, was located not by a SWAT team, but by a citizen, by a citizen that noticed something was wrong, by a citizen who was paying attention to his surroundings, and he's like, hey, that boat, there's been a tarp on that boat, and it's been secured for months, and it never moved, and it's flapping around. That's not right. So he investigates. Ooh, the rope's been cut. There's blood on the tarp. Hmm, that's not right. So he contacts the police, and they surround the area, and they exchange, like, crazy copious amounts of gunfire. And yet somehow the bad guy didn't die. So I don't not really sure how that worked and whatever. But they, they snatch him up, and now he's in custody. And I hope they have the board and the water standing by. And if you're a hippie, suck it. I'm sorry. But uh, we need to find out. I, I, don't, I do not believe for one second that these two guys, uh, and, and the jihadist number one, the older brother, had just in the last year traveled overseas to undisclosed locations. What was he learning how to do? Was he hanging out with his other jihad buddies, learning how to make bombs to kill the infidel? I would say probably. We need to uh, squeeze jihadist number two and find out who he's working with and if he has any more Chechnyan buddies hanging out in America. Because let me tell you what, Americans, if you don't know anything about Chechnyan Islamic terrorists, they're bad dudes. They don't play. They think you're an infidel. They want you to die. If you don't know anything about the Beslan school massacre because our American media doesn't like to talk about it, you need to educate yourself. Get on the Google machine, type in Beslan, B-E-S-L-A-N, massacre, and I want you to read up on it. I want you to harden up, and I want you to look at the images of those kids. The children in Russia that were tortured and murdered by Chechnyan separatists, by freedom fighters, horse crap. They're not freedom fighters. They're not separatists. They're Islamic terrorists who murdered and tortured children in a school in Beslan in 2004. And if you don't think that that could not occur here, you are a naive fool. And I suggest that you go listen to an NPR station. And the rest of us adults are going to sit here and listen to the rest of student of the gun. So what do we know? What are our choices in the wake of the Boston attack? Well, number one, you can harden up and you can decide, I'm not going to be a victim. 
I'm not going to throw my hands up and I'm not going to look at a benevolent government agency and say, help me, help me. It is the American citizen, the vigilant, armed and determined American citizen that's going to keep this nation free. Not some benevolent agency. Yes, there is play there. They, we need law enforcement. We need the FBI. We need the CIA to do their job. We need them to be hardcore like they were in the 80s and the 90s. We need them to be hardcore like they were during the Cold War era. We don't need them to be full of bureaucrats and politically correct government servants who, well, we see and read the papers, or, well, we don't read papers anymore, do we? Read the news on the Internet. Oh, what are we finding out now? That uh, government agencies knew about Johnny Jihad, Johnny Jihad older brother, that he was not a good person. Did we deport him? Did we investigate him? Did, oh, no. Because why? Well, because he's of Chechenian descent and he's an Islamic terrorist or he's a Muslim. Well, we, we don't want to look too hard at them because that would offend someone. If we're afraid to offend our enemy, how can we possibly survive as a nation? When you, you're more worried about offending the enemy than about the enemy killing your children, you've got a problem, America, and you need to solve it quick, fast, and in a hurry. So the next hippie liberal that tries to give you this we can't offend store thing, I, I think you might have a couple of things to say to them. So Boston bomb attack, what can you do? Oh, oh, oh I almost forgot, Jared. What happened uh, when, when they, they found out who uh, Johnny and Jimmy Jihad were and they were after him? They had a shootout, right? They killed that MIT police officer, chased him. They carjacked a dude. Carjacked Mr. Coexist. Uh, if you if you haven't seen the pictures, you can see them. Uh, they card they took a uh, I don't know BMW or something a black vehicle and had an awesome coexist bumper sticker on it. I'm not really sure how that worked out for Mr. Coexist. Probably not, probably not. Well, we tell you what. For those of you up in occupied territory, up in New York, Connecticut, Colorado, California, if you're listening to me, brothers, my heart goes out to you. You are in occupied America. But if you are in free America, like Jared and I are. Uh, if you're in free America and so Johnny Jihad comes up to carjack you, chances are you could shoot Johnny Jihad. And you say, I don't think so, Johnny. I don't think so. Try and carjack somebody in Tejas or Florida or Mississippi or Louisiana. Chances are really good if you run into a student of the gun that you're going to get smoke right there and your little jihad's going to be over. So we're just going to end your jihad right there. Maybe if Mr. Coexist was a student of the gun, we wouldn't have had to spend a thousand man hours hunting for Johnny through the neighborhoods of Watertown. He would have been laid out right there on the street. But I digress. All right. What do we want to talk about? What else do we want to talk about? Let me take a sip from my super awesome gun sight coffee mug here. Let's talk about the uh, gun control bill dies in the Senate. Yay. Go team. How does it feel to actually win America? American gun owners, do you feel a little bit good about yourself? Did you make enough phone calls and send enough letters to get in your uh, your senator's heads? That unfor I mean, it was close, though. It was only like, what, 54 to 54 to 46 or something close like that. It wasn't a, a landslide majority, but it was good enough to win. It actually scares me that there are that many senators in America that think it's a good idea to disarm the American people. That that does bother me. But we did it. We won. And uh, the Senate, the bill is dead now. And like all good and tolerant liberals, the liberals that look at you and tell you, you need to be tolerant. You need to be tolerant of all people. You need to be open minded. You need to be willing to compromise. How many times have the American gun owners, the American citizens been told you need to compromise? Really? Really? That's what we need to do? Why does compromise always mean us giving something up? Compromise always means the American citizen giving away some more of their liberty. Well, I'm, I, I don't know about you guys out there in the audience. Jared, are you done compromising? I have never compromised. Jared has never compromised, and he's not going to start now. But uh, what did what did our dear leader? What was our dear leader's reaction to his loss? 
It was kind of seemed like, how dare you peasants defy me? Jared's got the audio, and Jared is chom- he's over there on the other side of the board, and he's chomping at the bit, and he wants to put the audio in. So let's take a second and listen to the audio. And a few minutes ago, 90% of Democrats in the Senate voted for that idea. But it's not going to happen because 90% of Republicans in the Senate just voted against that idea. The gun lobby and its allies willfully lied about the bill. They claimed that it would create some sort of big brother gun registry. And unfortunately, this pattern of spreading untruths about this legislation served a purpose because those lies upset an intense minority of gun owners. And that, in turn, intimidated a lot of senators. So you you can judge that I'm not even going to I'm not even going to pass judgment on that audio. You can take it for what it is. Take it 100 percent on the face of it. Uh, and uh, if, if you think that sounds like a a statesman, like a leader, you know, like someone that Americans should get behind and that other nations will respect. Drive on, drive on and have an awesome day. So uh, <laughs> to me, I'm thinking that there's a bunch of spoiled children out there that are pretending to be adults in Washington, D.C., and they don't like it when they don't get their way. You peasants are really getting on our nerves. And if we could just figure out a way to get around you peasants, then uh, and there don't don't think for one second that they're not working on that. And unfortunately, you know, the good news is. You know, we got to them enough that they were able to, you know, that they recanted. The bad news is New York, Connecticut, Colorado, Massachusetts. Dude, Massachusetts is the top is in the top five of the Brady campaign's strongest gun control laws in America. Aren't you proud of yourselves? How did that be in top five in the, in the best gun control laws in America? How'd that work out in Boston? You mean gun control laws don't stop terrorists? What? This is, look at me. This is my surprise face. All right, moving on. Let's talk about something that every human being who shoots a gun needs to think about. Protecting your hearing. We had somebody uh, write in and they said, hey, Paul, let's talk about hearing protection. Okay, let's do it. Number one, if every gunshot can damage your every unmuffled, unsuppressed, non-suppressed gunshot can damage your ears. Yes, even 22s. If you're shooting, if you don't wear hearing protection because it's only a 22, you are fooling yourself. Uh, Back in the olden times when uh, I was coming in, I was becoming a student of the gun, I had adults say silly things to me like, oh, it's okay, your ears will get used to it. Or... Your ears will toughen up over time. Yeah, you know what that's called? That's called going deaf. Uh, <laughs> but but they would say it. People would say it. You, you get your crusty old guy at the skeet range, or or your your almost stone deaf, you know, gunnery or sergeant or first sergeant would say, ah, your ears will get used to it, or they'll toughen up over time. Yeah, that's because they're being slowly destroyed by the gunfire. <laughs> that's how they're toughening up. Your ears don't get used to it. And hearing damage isn't immediate. It's incremental. And what a lot of people fool themselves into thinking after their ears have rung, that ringing in your ears, everybody knows what that is, and the ringing goes away. And so they think, oh, my hearing is now back to normal. Well, I've talked to numerous audiologists, and I know a little bit about it. When the ringing stops, your hearing is not back to normal. It's been damaged. And if that happens over time, dudes, look, at if you're if you're young, if you're a young dude listening to me, hey, thanks for being here. But if you're in your 20s and 30s, eventually you're going to want to hear the voices of your grandchildren. Don't protect your ears, dudes, protect them for life. Uh, real simple stuff. Always have always have plugs. But know this, if you're around other people who are shooting, if you are shooting undercover, Oh my lord, those covers on the they're great for keeping the sun and the rain off of you, but if you got a guy next to you on a bench shooting a 223 or 7 millimeter Magnum, that sound goes up, hits the ceiling, comes right back down onto your head. Muff up. 
When I'm at an indoor range, I put plugs in and I also put muffs on. Now, if you've the great thing about t- technology today is we've come so far with our uh, audio and electrical electric technology that where you know 20 years ago it was it was expensive. You know uh, the uh, the sound clipping electronic earmuffs were relatively expensive and, and they weren't that good. Today, there's so many different types available that there's really almost no excuse not to have them. And especially if you're going to go to a training class, if you book time at a uh, a training school at any kind of academy, and you're going to go, take the extra you know forty to fifty dollars, and buy a set of electronic earmuffs that cut out the harmful sounds but amplify the good sounds. Uh, it'll save you from having to take your earmuffs on and off, on and off every time an instructor is saying something uh, to you. And they're really they they are worth the investment. So uh, give me some, uh, the Peltor makes good, I want the Champion, uh, the Champion company, uh, you guys know about Champion shooting accessories, uh, they make some good ones that are that are relatively inexpensive, uh, Peltor makes some good ones, who else makes good ones, Jared, Sonic Ears, uh, I think there's a company called Sonic Ears, but uh, do your research, do check out the Google machine, uh, type in there, uh, electronic earmuffs. You'll find them anywhere from like you know forty five to a hundred dollars, depending on what you buy. Uh, oh, Walker's game ears! I almost forgot about Walker game ears. Uh, the great thing about Walker's game ears is uh, they're actually designed with the hunter in mind, and and hunting counts too, guys. Don't kid yourself that well. I'm only going to fire one or two shots. One or two shots with a twelve gauge shotgun or a thirty out six or a 270 Winchester or what have you with unprotected ears is going to damage your ears. And especially if you're taking your kids out shooting, put the electronic muffs on your kids' heads so that they can hear the game and they can safely shoot it while protecting their ears. There's too much good equipment available right now to not do it. The only excuse for you not to have them is because you're being cheap or you're being lazy. So protect your ears and the and people are like, well, those are kind of expensive. Uh, you think a set of Walker game ears are expensive? What I want you to do right now is I want you to Google the cost of a set of hearing aids and compare the price because you're going to need one or the other. Either get the you know the electronic ear, earmuffs or protection, or eventually you're going to need the five to ten thousand dollar hearing aids. So hey, it's up to you, buddy. Uh, girls and guys. Now, as uh, as we near the end of the month of April, we are looking very much forward to our NRA annual meeting in Houston, Texas. That's right. It's coming up. If you guys can make it, fantastic. If you can't, we'll be there with you in spirit. But Student of the Gun is going to be there. We're going to be there with bells on, aren't we, Jared? Jared's not say he said, yeah, he'll be there with bells on. He does, he's a kid. He doesn't even know what that means. It's, just, it's totally foreign to him. <laughs> but we're going to be doing a whole bunch of book signings. We're going to be doing live events, live Student of the Gun events at the NRA show, at the NRA uh, annual meetings. And as you guys know, there's a big trade show. Uh, all the Most of the big manufacturers will be there. And if you're a member, you just show them your card and you get in. There's no charge or nothing. You just you come and hang out with us. Uh, let me see. Jared's putting up on my uh, on my little reader board there on my monitor, and we're we're going to put these up on the uh, the website. So if you're listening to me on iTunes or Stitcher or what have you, and you want to read some of the uh, information or you want to link to it, you can go to uh, studentofthegunradio.com and you can check it all out. But on Friday, uh, that Friday the third of May. We're going to be at the Duracoat booth, and that's number 2535 from 10 to 11. And the Duracoat booth, they're actually sharing a booth with DS Arms, so if you check them out and you're looking for DS Arms, you can find that. We're going to be at the Excess Sites booth at, from 3 to 4 p.m. Then on Saturday, we're going to be at the Keltec booth from 10 to 11. And we'll also be at the Kiapa Firearms booth from 1 to 2. And while we're there, we're going to be recording a radio show uh, from the floor of the NRA show, from the NRA annual meeting in Houston. And and also, we want to let you know, Jared's giving me sign language over there, and I'm, I'm not really digging his sign language. So. But uh, also, there's going to be a Firearms Radio Network 
listener meetup. That's right. If you are a fan of the Firearms Radio Network and you're going to be in the Houston area on Saturday, the 4th of May, what you can do is you can go to Lucky's Pub, and that's at 801 St. Emanuel Street in Houston, Texas. So uh, like I said last week, I'm not buying your beer, but if you want to show up, that would be cool. So uh, we're looking forward to that a lot. If you can't be there, hey, we're sorry, but we'll be there with you in spirit. And uh, if you you say, well, I, I can't get your book because I'm not going to be there. Remember, for everything Student of the Gun, if you want to follow us, you want to know what's going on. And if you're not following studentofthegun.com, if you haven't signed up for our weekly newsletter, you're really shortchanging yourself. You should. Uh, a lot. I get questions all week long. Uh, via Facebook or via the you know the uh, contact us tab or what have you, and uh, f- quite frankly, a lot of times dudes and dudettes, uh, the questions that you send me, if you were following Student of the Gun and if you signed up for our, our you know our weekly newsletter and our press releases, you would already know the answer to that question because uh, a lot of times we we talk about it. If it's not on the radio show, we deal with it on the television show. Uh, we, we every uh, every week we put up new student of the gun home rooms, the little short snippets, uh, little short topics that we talk about, and uh, we put up articles every week, so you can check those out. Oh, and uh, Jared wants me to remind you guys that no, we will not spam your inbox every day if you sign up for the newsletter. You can be rest assured, you you can rest assured that if I send you something or student of the gun sends you something, it's important and you need to address it. Okay, the last topic we want to talk about today is what I call skill matters. And this actually occurred this week uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. What happened was a Craigslist deal gone bad. Now, a lot of you guys that sell on Craigslist or buy on Craigslist, what, what do you normally do? Well, we arrange to meet in a parking lot in a public place because everyone thinks what? Well, if, if it's a public place, then certainly I'll be safe because – you know, the other person who I don't know, this stranger who wants to sell me something or buy something from me, they they won't try anything because it's a public place. Well, not always. What happened in Fort Worth this last week as we record this is uh, there was a, uh, a Craigslist set up. A guy was going to buy a mobile phone. And he saw the, the ad and he's like, okay, well, let's meet in this uh, parking lot at this shopping center. So they get there. And the guy who claimed to have a mobile phone to sell decides that instead of selling the gentleman a mobile phone, he's going to rob him. Hmm. His name was Desmond Page, age 20, a recently paroled felon who had been in prison, according to the story, for a violent felony. Well, I'm glad that we can't keep violent felons in prison, that parole works much better. <laughs> oh, that doesn't? Oh, okay. Well, Desmond Page decided he was going to rob the gentleman instead of actually selling him a mobile phone. Well, you know what Desmond did? He committed what my friend Masad Ayub calls a critical error in the victim selection process. And Moss has been using that for years, like decades. His critical error was that his victim or his would-be victim was a Texas CHL holder. So he decided, well, I'm not going to have any of this. He draws his concealed carry handgun and he shoots his robber in the chest. Now, the the unfortunately, the details in this are kind of sketchy. Uh, and the story that I have from Fox News, the local Fox News. See, what happened was it wasn't um, <laughs> it wasn't a situation that would make the normal news cycle because it, it wasn't a an American citizen doing something bad. It was an American citizen doing something good. And we don't really care about that in the news today. So. He, uh, the, the good guy took a round through the wrist. The bad guy took several rounds to the upper chest. Bad guy expires. Good guy lives. Yay team. Well, number one, what do we learn about that? A, this guy, unlike most folks who talk themselves out of carrying, carried. Good for him. It was the middle of the day. He was still carrying. Good for him. And, uh, his skill through his skill, he put rounds into the center mass upper chest area of the bad guy. That's how we stop people with handguns. We make them stop by putting rounds up into the center chest area. He did it. Bad guy expired. Now, the good guy won his gunfight, but he was still injured and had a bullet or an injury through the arm and wrist, and he uh, needed medical attention. So what do we learn? Sometimes you win your gunfight and still end up bleeding. 
So uh, he, he was able to get medical attention, and uh, last the story we heard that uh, it doesn't look like he's going to um, lose the arm or anything, that he's going to be okay. So remember that. Sometimes good guys bleed, and we need to be prepared to deal with it because you could win your gunfight but still end up bleeding. And that kind of goes right back to our, are you, you want to do something, but will you be able to, if you are willing to and able to put holes into bad people, you need to be willing and able to plug those holes because it might not just be the bad guy. It might be you. It might be your spouse. It might be your kid. Now, as we come to the close, we want to make sure that we thank and acknowledge our good friends at Kiltec Weapons of uh, Cocoa, Florida, and, of course, Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. And we really appreciate their support in uh, bringing you Student of the Gun Radio. We couldn't do it without them. And, of course, our friends at the Firearms Radio Network. Now, remember, you're a beginner once, but you should be a student for life. 